What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonas. This is episode 55, and this week we're going to be taking a good look at this week's NXT and NXT UK, and we've got a special guest host um, on board with us this week. Uh, we'll be talking to that guest host very, very soon. We'll be looking a little bit about the, the wrestling landscape as a whole, WWE, Raw, SmackDown, AEW, a little bit about the, the big weekend from last weekend. We had so much wrestling action going on around the world. Um, it really was quite an exciting exciting weekend for all wrestling fans um but uh, before we get into any of that just want to uh, throw out a few plugs there for the podcast of course if you want to reach out to us and find us on twitter you can do our twitter handle is with john underscore pod uh, on instagram it's uh, instagram.com forward slash wrestling with Jonas. and of course uh, why not go out and uh, be part of our facebook group just go onto facebook and search wrestling with Jonas. If you're listening to this podcast on Apple iTunes, please don't forget to leave us a five star rating. And of course, if you enjoy listening to this podcast, please don't forget to hit like, subscribe, share and shout about this podcast. Shout about Wrestling with Jonas. Uh, this is the only podcast for all of your weekly NXT, NXT UK, WWE and all round pro wrestling needs. So please spread the word and tell your friends, tell your family, like I always say, and help to grow this podcast so that we can continue to produce quality content for you each and every week. Um, so our guest host, as I alluded to earlier, is the one and only David Anderson, back for another turn on the Wrestling With Jonas podcast. Uh, good evening, David, and w- welcome to the podcast. Good evening. It's a joy to be back, as always. Yeah, absolutely fantastic to have you back. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about uh, this week. You know, I want to kind of talk about the current WWE product and um, look at the, the big weekend of wrestling that was the last week, uh, culminating with Extreme Rules, going into Raw and SmackDown. Of course, we we'll talk our usual NXT and NXT UK, which were absolutely fantastic shows this week. I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, but first of all, I'd, I'd like to kind of talk to you and find out what you've been up to, where you've been on your travels and what wrestling shows you've been up to. So, it's been about a month since we last spoke, but what have you? I know that most weekends uh, you're out and about on your travels watching independent wrestling shows around the country. So uh, tell our listeners uh, what you've been up to recently, David. Well, most recently I was actually uh, trying to take a break from wrestling, but just like a good Godfather film, it, it pulled me back in. Um, I, was, I was visiting um, my mum up in Newcastle and I realised that that coincided with an MEW show, so I decided to take in the first one of them. Uh, they're based around uh, the Long Benton area of Newcastle, <laughs> anybody who knows that area. Um, right. It's literally right outside the train station, so fantastic for anybody who's traveling to that venue. And I mean literally right outside, it's almost attached to the train station. Um, very well attended event. Um, the the fans in there are obviously very diehard and seem to know a lot about every you know, the little nuances of every single uh, character and performer on the card. Uh, notable names that you might be aware of, uh, Little Miss Roxy and uh, H.T. Drake, um, uh, Adam Maxted, who also is famous, infamous, call it what you will, for a Love Island stint. Uh, that was the main event, H.T. Drake and uh, Adam Maxted, a very entertaining and at times amusing uh, show, but uh, or main event, I should say. Um, otherwise, you had names like uh, Sean Only and, and a few more local names who I didn't know, but all put on like uh, good quality performances, especially for a, a family-based show. So yeah, a good night, and uh, you know I definitely would go back there again if I was up in that neck of the woods. There you go. You couldn't even go one weekend when you was up visiting your your, your family without watching a wrestling show, David. <laughs> but uh, that's dedication for you. That's dedication. Um, so, so uh, have you seen anything else recently, or have you got any any shows that you're looking forward to seeing in the next uh, few weeks? Um, I know that uh, we are a little over a month away from Takeover Cardiff, and you're going to a Rev Pro show that weekend as well. But uh, anything between now and then, David? Uh, I've got uh, Sunday Girls, which is headlined by a certain wrestler you might have heard of called Tunstorm. Um, ah, uh, yeah, I think you've mentioned her once or twice. Uh, you know, she's not, not a really big name, but you know, <laughs> she's get by. But uh, she's wrestling um, Miko Satomura, so guaranteed fantastic main event there. Uh, you've got a card full of the Sunday Girls uh, mixed with obviously some UK talent like uh, Session Moth, who I actually prefer Session Goth, but that's another story for another day. Um, but yeah, that, that should be a fantastic event. Those girls always put the work in, as you know. So, and after that, um, it's uh, Awesome Kong, even with Awesome Kong. So that should be fantastic as well, hearing all about her career and life and what she's doing with herself these days, including AEW, I imagine. Hmm. 
Yeah, it sounds like uh, you've got a, a fun uh, the Sendai Girl show is, is one that I would love to go to. But it's uh, say I, I live too far, far away to kind of get there. But um, that that main event, uh, uh, Tony Storm versus um, uh, Seiko. Could, could you repeat her name? Sorry. <laughs> Mako Satamora. Mako, of course. I. I it's on the tip of my tongue, um, but uh, of course uh, sh- she's probably familiar with the WWE listeners um, or audience from the May Young Classic of last year, um, where she really made a name for herself and was definitely the kind of one of the standout talents from that tournament and one that I was kind of hoping they they might uh, be interested in signing. But uh, obviously she's got uh, bigger fish to fry. She's got her own promotion in Japan, of course. Um, so. Um, that's going to be an excellent main event. But uh, And then, of course, um, in a little over a month, we'll all be meeting up in Cardiff, of course, for TakeOver, uh, NXT UK TakeOver. And you've got the Rev Pro show um, the night before, I believe. So uh, lots of wrestling to be had between now and then. And, of course, although we're touching it um, in a bit more detail uh, very soon, you've got between now and then NXT TakeOver Toronto. You've got SummerSlam from Toronto. Um, so yeah, it's uh, like I say, going to be a busy summer for wrestling fans. But um, let, let's talk about some of the current product then, David. So last weekend, I refer to it as kind of the big wrestling weekend, a big weekend of wrestling where you had AEW with their Fight for the Fallen show on Saturday night. That coincided with Evolve's uh, one three one show there. there Tenth anniversary show. It actually should be uh, their nine and a half year anniversary because their tenth anniversary isn't till uh, um, early 2020. But um, two big shows there going head to head, and of course, the Evolve show was playing live on the WWE Network. So obviously, we know that uh, Evolve have had ties and connections with the WWE for many years now. Um, and uh, Gabe Sapolsky, who runs evolve um, actually helps out with the nxt booking and the nxt product and he's there at all the tapings and uh, takeover um so he's part of their creative team there so they do have some some connections in many ways i suppose you could say but the, for the first time ever the wwe have shown live uh, kind of an indie promotion or uh, a promotion other than a wwe based product on their on their network so this was uh, something to get really excited about, especially with um, AEW being really hot at the moment and uh, then being two shows in before Fight for the Fallen. Uh, what were your kind of thoughts ahead of last Saturday? Um, I know that we mentioned off air that uh, we both saw the Evolve show and we were yet to see Fight for the Fallen. Um, but um, what was that a conscious effort to watch one over the other? What were your kind of thoughts ahead of last Saturday especially? Not really, but I think it's um, you know it's almost hard. It, it, we're, we're spoiled, aren't we, at the moment with the sheer amount of wrestling, and that makes it hard to sometimes uh, fit it all in. I know there's kind of two trains of thoughts with wrestling fans at the moment. Some see it as a fantastic thing that uh, Evolve and other networks are potentially going on the, the WWE network. Now, this is something that's been planned for a long time with um, the WWE network to expand its uh, you know choice of promotions and things like that and, the, and the, you know it goes back to them adding a lot of different companies from the past as well to kind of expand that library i mean you know yourself if you if you're watching a tv um channel or something like that you want to have plenty of choice in, in your viewing and sometimes we have almost too much choice on sky and things like that but uh, there's there's two trains of thought as i say a lot of people are saying you know uh, the cynical ones are saying that well this is just a deliberate um you know attempt to hurt aw and yeah, and I, I don't really see it that way. I know a lot of people would say I was biased towards WWE and that, but I say that you know WWE has to expand as a as a network that's offering a service, just like a Netflix or anything else, has to expand its service, and they're giving fans exactly what they want. There's also the other train of thought that they're they're worried that these groups will not be themselves anymore and be uh, you know sort of absorbed into WWE as it did in the past with other territories for one reason or another. It wasn't always the case that WWE put them out of business, but you know that's another story for another day. Um, mm. But you know, I, I think the wrestling fan would say this is a fantastic thing, more choice. You know, uh, even if it means that the price of the network goes up slightly, you know, it has been the same price for the last four or five years, so we can't really moan about that if we're getting extra content and offers and things like that and first chances to see. You know, content or whatever, or you know, whether it's offers to get discounts off merch or even the the subscription itself, whatever that evolves into, no pun intended. 
But uh, and then there's the other side, as I said, the, the people who think it's just a deliberate attempt to undermine AEW. That promotions can't stop doing things or you know running a show or something like that because another company exists. Yes, there's obviously the the factor of you know um, they want to kind of be top dog and make sure nobody takes that spot. But that's that's simply business. So that that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean. Uh, Fight for the Fallen uh, wasn't really a, a card that interests me in particular. I think I, I'm, I'm definitely going to be watching All Out. I thought Double or Nothing was excellent. I think when you've got the the, the, the bigger, more exciting, more grand uh, pay-per-views to look forward to, you, you're going to have the better matches. And I think they're already starting to build the card for, for All Out. Certainly with, uh, it's looking like John Moxley versus uh, Kenny Omega and uh, Chris Jericho versus uh, Hangman Page uh, for the AEW title. Um, so there's a couple of matches announced already and, and they're both uh, mouth-watering ties. Um, but kind of the, what I'm kind of getting from their second and third show, so Fighter Fest and Fight for the Fallen, is that although the, the the matches are okay the, the the product's good probably not quite to the standard as what we were all treated to with double or nothing i still feel that they're taking maybe pot shots every so often at the wwe or maybe trying to uh trying a bit too hard really i didn't like the chair the, the chair shot from sean spears um to the head of cody Rhodes uh, a couple of shows ago and then of course you got chris jericho busting open hangman page on a fight for the fall in this past saturday with a, a really shoddy looking uh, code breaker to the face and it, it seems like they're trying a bit too hard and working a bit unsafe at the moment and causing unnecessary injuries um, I mean, kind of what's your thoughts on what you've seen or what you've heard um, certainly about some of those spots anyway that seem to be getting attention for all the wrong re- all the wrong reasons David um, I mean I, I didn't actually see I mean obviously I've, I've seen people post about it uh, since then and stuff the actual chair shop but I saw the results and I saw Cody uh, stitched up and what have you I think at the moment they're so desperately trying to see where the exact opposite or uh, different that everything that WWE is doing that sometimes it, it just seems a little bit petty what they're doing. And certainly when you've got people like Cody Rhodes who basically started out in WWE and, and was given plenty of opportunities, despite what anybody says about him being wasted, just look at all the championships he held, whether they were secondary championships or not. That, his name was established in WWE. And then you've got the likes of Chris Jericho and Goldust who were there for like two decades or whatever. Yeah. Won countless titles, especially Jericho. Uh, were made world famous stars by the company. Now, I know Jericho is a fantastic player online and uses social media to favor the agenda of whatever project he's got, and that's again good business, but it also looks very petty and sort of you know, he, he was made in the WWE, whatever you say about ECW or WCW or whatever, that was the sort of nucleus of his career. But now, you know, like WWE was what made him, and now he's kind of like just stabbing them in the back or right in the front, if you, uh, if you will. But, um, yeah. I just I just think it's unnecessary. As I said to you just before we came on air, it's like uh, WCW was at its best when it was focusing on cruiserweights and tag teams and a better women's division and everything else. And and the cruiserweights are a big part of what brought um, you know new fans to, and it looked edgy and exciting and more adult orientated when WWE was having TL Hopper and the Goon and all these cartoonish characters, but. They did the best when they got on with being a good wrestling show, just like WWE did. And there was all the little petty pot shots back and forward. But did that really create any new viewers? Did that really make people want to change the channel? Apart from when it backfired royally, when they made people change the channel, uh, Mankind winning the title because they were so petty and they were losing the war by then. You know, no, uh, I'd rather watch a wrestling match than see Eric Bischoff sit on a motorbike and talk about how he's the king of wrestling. It, it's... It's such petty, it's like the Shane McMahon thing that's going on now. Yes, it's part of the storyline. Yes, it's part of his character and all the rest of it. But is anybody else just sick of seeing Shane McMahon ad nauseum when people should be getting pushed like Drew McIntyre and people like that? And then we yeah. should be this rebuilding stage of WWE. It, it's, it's also pointless. Concentrate on being the best product you can and stop worrying about the other guy and then you'll be successful. Mm. I mean, one... one um... 
one thing that I really want to kind of uh, highlight from the Evolve show that I, I really enjoyed the women's match, uh, Brandy Lauren versus Shotzi Blackheart. So I don't know if you've seen any of the, those two work on the indie scenes, whether they've come out to the UK before, but uh, I don't know if you saw that spot that uh, Shotzi Blackheart took where there was a like a tower of chairs set up on the outside. She dived through the ropes face first into the chairs. It looked as stiff as hell, but I, I really, you know, really enjoyed that match, and I think that that kind of demonstrated that there's a lot more. I mean, you're a big fan of women's wrestling, David. Um, you, you've always been a big proponent of, of women's wrestling, um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if you got a chance to see that match or what. What kind of stood out to you from the Evolve show uh, that you remember? I, I certainly did see that match, and I was actually sort of rolling my eyes when I seen that immediately due to the, you know no disqualification stipulation or whatever that somebody else interfered which you know in, in a WWE match might undermine it you know or just make it seem really pointless or just like they're punishing the, the other person that's at the disadvantage and, but in that case it, it did become a really exciting match and you know a very hard hitting match for a women's match I mean it's not so much that I'm a proponent of women's wrestling although I love it but it's just simply the way the business has gone now isn't it you know women are made yeah. women are uh, headlining they, you know, huge pay-per-views like WrestleMania, and you know they're getting to do all the matches that the. And, and I'm a proponent of you know not having the era of hair pulling and scratching and divas and everything else. Obviously, good wrestling is good wrestling, whether it's male, female, or otherwise. You know, but um, yeah, I thought Evolve was a good show. There wasn't. I, I felt like because it was a 10th anniversary, maybe it's just the greedy wrestling fan in me. But I, I felt like there should be more that really stands out and makes you go, "Wow, I really need to tune back into this. This is a really good show." To me, it, it felt a lot like a. Not, not quite so good takeover show like you know it was like there was there was some good efforts and um i can't remember the name of the fellow that was in a uh, josh it was josh like uh josh that. briggs that's the one he, he was yeah. in the, he was very impressive now you know you look at a lot of guys like a baron corbin and somebody and you see a big guy but i thought you know he, he not only had the moves and went to do them and everything else and he not a lot of wasted motion but he seemed to have that sort of it factor that comes across in a wrestler and i think with development i mean I could imagine, you know, Triple H and others having eyes on him because he just looks like your typical, you know, next star for an NXT brand or something like that. But there was a lot of, a lot of potential for wrestlers. But the one thing I did find though is that a lot of rest. I don't know if it was a deliberate policy to humanize them or whatever, but a lot of wrestlers had very unoutstanding names, and and it, they seemed very sort of, you know, generic. It was like the the old NXT name generator kind of thing. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some very solid wrestling, but some very out unoutstanding gimmicks you know you need you need everybody says you know your best shows are a good bit of wrestling and a good bit of flying and some tag team matches and some hardcore matches a variety you know and, and it seemed like we had a lot of good wrestlers but nothing that we i mean the reason why shotzi and and that match stood out was because they had characters and there was a reason for them to fight and everything else you know so they stood out and that's what we remember yeah, absolutely. And the, the kind of the top three matches of, of that show, you had uh, Matt Riddle, um, who defeated uh, Drew Gulak um, in, in a, quite a, a, a stiff match and um, uh, slightly un WWE or un NXT match, uh, you could say. They, they really did go all out. And these two wrestlers are renowned for being quite stiff, and we've seen a wrestle before on NXT, uh, but that was a very good match. Uh, you had Austin Theory. Um, versus J.D. Drake in a winner-takes-all match where uh, um, Austin, of course, is the Evolve champion. J.D. Drake was the WWN champion and uh, it was a, a unification or a, a winner-takes-all match and Austin Theory managed to win that match in 16 minutes and that was very good. And I didn't realise until the night that Austin Theory is only 23 years old and he, he looks the part, he definitely plays the part and um, I know I've said many times that I was at kind of New Orleans last year, 2018, and I saw him um, at uh, in a wrestling match at uh, Access uh, on WrestleMania morning. Uh, I can't remember who he wrestled. No, it might have been Marcel Bartel, but it was a hell of a match. And um, I didn't realize so at the time he would have been 21, 22, but uh, he seems to have been around for forever in theory. You know, I know we both saw him in the flesh at uh, Progress in, in Birmingham in March um, where he wrestled Trent Seven. But uh, yeah, 23 years of age. And um, yeah, like I say, he's definitely one that looks looks the part, plays the part. I think he's going to be big money in the future. And then, of course, Adam Cole defeated Akira Tozawa when he was putting his NXT championship on the line in the main event. And of course, uh, the show closed with Johnny Gargano 
fronting Adam Cole uh, to close the show to kind of further their feud. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about uh, Gargano and Cole um, a little bit later on. Let's let's have a quick look at um, Extreme Rules, David. Now, I was meant to have done a, uh, a review show uh, this uh, a few days ago, but uh, work caught up with me and I ran out of time. Um, but uh, Extreme Rules on the whole is he's getting mostly positive reviews. Um, starting with the pre-show, you obviously had Shinsuke Nakamura defeat Defeat Finn Balor to become the new Intercontinental Champion. Uh, Drew Gulak defeated former Cruiserweight Champion Tony Nese to retain his championship. Uh, the opening match of the main show was The Undertaker and Roman Reigns versus Shane McMahon and Drew uh, McIntyre. I thought that was a really well-booked and fairly entertaining match. Considering the participants, um, I thought that uh, certainly Drew McIntyre seemed to look uh, quite strong by the end of the match. Obviously, The Undertaker and Roman Reigns got the win and looked uh, very strong throughout. I quite enjoyed the interference from Elias. I thought it was a well-booked match considering the participants. Uh, what was your thoughts on that that opener between The Undertaker, Roman Reigns, Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre? Well, even before I get to that, I mean, looking at the card, a lot of people have like low expectations of what they call the B pay-per-views that are on a SummerSlam or a WrestleMania. But I mean, mm. personally looking at it, there was at least five matches on an on the kickoff show and on the main card that were going to be at least good matches. Um, when it comes to Shinsuke winning the title, it's just a shame that he's always on a kickoff show. I know Vince hates anybody saying pre-show, but, um, you know, it's a shame that at this point we've been uh, conditioned to believe that Shinsuke is a placeholder and probably two weeks somebody else will have that belt. But hopefully now that we're moving into the eras of, you know, Paul Heyman behind the scenes and more, a bit more realism and things to be more consistent and have con- consequence that we'll see some more you know, title reigns that mean something. I thought it was a a very good pay-per-view overall. I think it was good that they put the Shane McMahon match on first because I think everybody's getting very tired of him. I know I certainly am, and I've referred to that. Um, You know, um, as cool as the Graveyard Dog's name is, and it's a fantastic T-shirt idea but and merchandise and all that, I would have really liked to see, like, Drew McIntyre get a pinfall over, especially, like, The Undertaker. That would really have enhanced him, you know. You've got a guy that's the... The Scottish psychopath that they constantly refer to, and then you know they don't seem to know what they're doing. For one minute he's dominating somebody, the next minute he's getting beaten by Cedric Alexander, who was you know just yeah, yeah. janitor the week before. So I don't I don't know if that's just a um, you know conflict in booking and there's different ideas being thrown. Somebody sees something in Drew and somebody else doesn't. But you know we need to start, and when I think we spoke about this previously, you know, we need to start evolving where new main event if Roman Reigns is there that's fine he's a consistent performer like him or hate him you know but we need the Drew McIntyre's we need people that we can believe are you know a threat and not just somebody that you can mow down with the same move set and what have you but I, I thought you know going right through that card there was a hell of a lot more good than there was bad you know just thinking about the card as a whole whether it was the new day tag team match or whatever it, it was a solid card all the way through and I don't see how anybody can have any real issues with it no, definitely. And I saw you comment on your, your Facebook group, Turning Heel, that uh, the Alistair Black and Cesaro match certainly stood out to you. And it, it was uh, short and sweet, went just under 10 minutes, but it was solid, stiff action all the way through. And um, you saw one or two of them, uh, you know, strikes actually connect. You know, they, they, they really didn't hold back. Um, give us your thoughts on that match in particular, because I know that it impressed you just as just as much as it did me, David. Well, I think it's just nice to see Cesaro being rebuilt again. He's another name that should be consistently, you know, in the main event scene, if not holding a championship. And everybody said it forever, you know. But here's a guy that obviously, when those stiff strikes are coming in, he's not going to be bothered about that. This is the same guy that like bit a turnbuckle and carried right on with the match as if nothing was going on. And you know, you had that T-shirt with him with his teeth smashed out. This speaks to the like um not only the like commitment but the the toughness of of the man you know and how anybody you know you can make all these uh, comments about well he's not a good promo there's a lot of wrestlers that aren't a good promo but they're still you know on that top layer you can always put a, a manager or somebody with them that can make up for that discrepancy but he's a fantastic worker and he's still somebody that people want to invest in they want to believe that he can make it you know despite a I remember, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years ago, we had the whole thing about the brass ring and that he was referring yeah. to you could never reach it. And we just want to see him succeed. We just want to see the, the, the good guys and the good performers that have put the graft in over the years um, be recognized. And this was another illustration of when, when he's given even 10 minutes, he can create something that's still progressive and still exciting for the fans. Yeah. 
Um, what, what was your thoughts on the the Braun Strowman Bobby Lashley last man standing match? Uh, I thought it was uh, quite a decent match. I, I quite enjoyed the brawling through the arena and the, the kind of the the backstage area and the merch stand and. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a, a fairly good match for what it is. But not only do I want your thoughts on the match, I kind of want your thoughts on, you know, what's what's the end goal for Braun Strowman? Is it is he going to be lined up for a future championship match again, only to you know only to be defeated by a Brock Lesnar, for example? You know, are they ever really going to kind of pull the trigger on Braun? I think. Um, I mean, to me, it felt. I, I don't know if you got that um, sort of feeling from it, but it did feel feel a bit attitudinary. If that's a, if that's a word, even you know, it, it felt like a match that could fit into that. You know, the if you remember the match between Raven and Kane and uh, Big Show at WrestleMania, and they were they were fighting all over the stage and everything. You know, there's little shades of that. But I know um, you probably read yourself that Paul Heyman is big on uh, Braun Strowman, and you know he wants to kind of rebuild his character. And we've seen so much 50-50 booking with him again. That one minute he's a monster, and the next minute he's teaming with a kid, and then he's getting destroyed off Brock Lesnar that he needs to be a monster you know and even somebody commented on my group um today that you know if he's even when he's re-signed a new contract which he's just mentioned that he signed for another four or five years he's putting up a tweet about uh, putting smiles on faces and you know while he's there to entertain people somebody put well if he's, he's there to put smiles on faces he's not doing the monster character correctly mm. um, so yeah I get both sides of the argument there but it's like I hope this is the start of a rebuilding phase for Braun. I know he's had a lot of injury issues and the, the seem a bit, you know, concerned about pulling the trigger on him in that respect. And he, and he may still be a little greedy. He's still like he has a, where he was when he was first starting out with the, you know, and then yeah. the Wyatt family. But not every monster, as we've discussed before, has to be a technical marvel. But, he, he, you know, he's a he's a spectacle and used correctly and, and not, you know, overused like any character. He could be extremely effective and possibly even a champion. Yeah, definitely. And um, I know going into Extreme Rules, I was particularly looking forward to AJ Styles versus Ricochet. Um, there was quite a bit of outside interference from Gallows and Anderson, which kind of... I don't know, it, it, it didn't really allow the, the match to evolve or materialise uh, the way I was hoping it would. Obviously, Ricochet got attacked uh, prior to, to, to the start of the match, which obviously had a, a knock-on effect to how the match uh, went. Um, but um, I would really like to have seen these two go at it one-on-one -on -one without any outside interference. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the fact that uh, the club appear to be back together and they are actually doing something with uh, Gallows and Anderson. Um, but uh, I felt that the, that the match could have been better um, and hopefully we'll get some form of rematch between the two of them at SummerSlam. What were your thoughts on uh, AJ versus Ricochet? Uh, I think the only thing that hurt it for me was the fact that we'd had the two matches before in such close proximity. I, I don't know if it's even possible in the day and age of where everything goes at lightning speed in wrestling, but I think we need where sometimes wrestlers don't touch for a while. Um, you know, you, you can have a, a really yeah. good match and then you could have had the AJ heel turn and then you could have just had the club and AJ undermining Ricochet at every turn, whether it's sneak attacks or, you know, attacking even people that he's associated with and just teasing that they're going to, have a go at them and then having a go at them and you know and obviously uh, anybody who's ever saw a bullet club or you know or club match in japan knows that it's always all the order of the day that you know you're going to get outside interference and stuff but it, be, it can be done in such a way that it's enjoyable and expected and everything right now seems a little rushed so if, if the plan is to like re-establish the club and re-establish gallows and anderson and even aj as as heels then the need to be a bit more steady with the booking and not just like hotshot everything, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Kevin Owens defeated Dolph Ziggler in 17 seconds. Just uh, looking at the uh, the Kofi Kingston Samoa Joe match, David. Um, I think a lot of people were underwhelmed by that match and didn't really live up to expectations. Kind of, where are you on the kind of the the Kofi Kingston as WWE champion? He's been champion for about four or five months now, and of course it was a fairy tale match and a fairy tale storyline that uh, culminated at WrestleMania when he won the championship over Daniel Bryan. Um, a lot of people were disappointed with his match on Sunday against Samoa Joe. What were your thoughts on that? What were your thoughts on on uh, Kofi Kingston? Is there still more life to be had as Kofi with the cha with the championship, David? Um, I, I think the chase has been better than the payoff. Obviously, the build he alluded to has been, you know, really good with uh, Daniel Bryan and the Elimination Chamber and every and eventually the 
the big win, but unfortunately the payoff that we have now. I mean, it, Kofi's a consistent performer. He's all, he never phones it in really. He, he always brings it, whether it's on a secondary show or on a main show, and he's been a consistent performer for what over eleven years, whatever it is. Um, I just I just don't see him as a headliner. Like it, it was a nice little fairy story, and for a transitional champ or a short term champ. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, it's not like some something I've came to immediately. It, it's just his character. I, I don't think is a headline act. Um, it's not really developed from his his mid card persona. Um, and uh, the new day are entertaining, but uh, again, it's it's not it's not a headline thing. It's it's part of the show. Unfortunately, I, I think it's time for you know some monster heel to savage him like a Samoa Joe or somebody. I mean. Samoa Joe's been consistent all the time and especially entertaining on the, the mic. He's improved so much in that department over the years. It's unreal. And he's, he's always, um, you know, um, entertaining, as I say. But um, I definitely think it's time for a, a new champion and somebody to come along and uh, crush Kofi's dream, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, the company obviously likes Samoa Joe because they keep giving him opportunities. They obviously like the fact that he's a, a big heel, fantastic on the mic, um, sometimes delivers in the ring. And obviously he delivered uh, at WrestleMania where he became US champion, but he, he promptly lost that championship and he, he's lost his match against uh, Kofi Kingston. So much very similar to the Braun Strowman scenario is kind of, you know, w when are they going to get it right, so to okay. speak, or, or probably more similar to the Drew McIntyre situation. We've got two very capable, very credible heels, but they're not really kind of using them properly as heels or giving them, um, you know, a, a, a decent amount of wins under their belt in order to make them credible or, or more credible opponents for the champion nowadays. They seem to lose more than they win. But um, let's, let's have a look at uh, the, the main event. So it's a mixed match challenge um, and uh, it was kind of a winner takes all. Um, so it's, yeah, it's an extreme rules mixed match match, uh, mixed match, challenge match, whatever you want to call it. It, 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 was, it was long and uh, yes. Uh, so Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch, uh, the Universal and Raw Women's Champion, uh, respectively going up against Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans. Um, and uh what did you think of this one? This one went, it was the longest match of the night, David, at 20 minutes. And um, Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch uh, was able to retain their championships. And uh, give us your thoughts on this match before we kind of talk about uh, Brock Lesnar. Well, I think the biggest sort of talking points that came out of it was uh, a, a booking ideology kind of uh, change of attitude, as it was. And, and the pun is intended there. Uh, we saw, you know, a bit of a racy uh, kind of idea with um, Lacey, uh, Racy Lacey, uh, having a, um, Seth Rollins' name on a, on a rear, which was shown very prominently um, several times during the match. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then obviously you had the spot where Baron Corbin hit the end of days on uh, Becky, which was unheard of male-on-female violence for the most part for the last few years in, in WWE. And uh, I don't know how the investors or, you know, the the middle class people who don't like that kind of thing look at it, but you know it, it's a contact sport and they're all trained wrestlers, so you know I, I don't really have an issue with it as long as it doesn't go too far. We're not seeing like unprotected chair shots to the top of women's heads and things like that, you know. Um, it, it did create a little bit more buzz to a match that I think we all realised that you know neither Baron nor um, Lacey were ever going to go over. I think a bigger issue that a lot of fans have is considering that the you know, life partners now is the lack of real chemistry between uh, Becky and Seth as, as you know, as a unit or as, in, in talking segments or whatever. And I think it kind of takes a little bit away from both the characters because you had the man who was like so independent and anti-authority and then you had Seth who was, you know, this go-getter and like the, the main event player that you could guarantee to have a really excellent match and now they're this lovey-dovey couple. So I think it kind of takes away a little bit from the character yeah again it might be a t-shirt seller or you know a good little twitter hashtag or you know what a little talking point but when it comes to selling tickets in, in an arena is it is it really what you want because a lot of people seem to be sour on it i know you know fans have short attention spans nowadays more than ever and it's because of the way the product's gone and the, the you know life as a whole but um i think the better report you know when it comes to on-screen characters than they are together yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, let's say, after, after the championship match ended, um, 
Paul Heyman delivered on his promise from earlier on in the show where he said that Brock Lesnar is there and he will be cashing in his briefcase on one of the champions. Um, of course, the Kofi match ended uh, the, the, the match before. So if it was going to be anybody, it was going to have to be Seth Rollins. And we heard that uh, uh, Brock Lesnar music, how he came. He handed over his briefcase to Paul Heyman, who cashed it in with the referee. And uh, 13 seconds later, we have a, a new universal champion of Brock Lesnar is, is now the kind of first and only three time universal champion. Now, I know that when Brock Lesnar was a universal champion leading up to WrestleMania this year, a lot of people were very, very bored with his reign, uh, very, very bored with his run. Um, obviously, the character of Brock Lesnar is very protected. We don't see him on TV very often, which kind of makes him special to a certain degree. But then people want to see their champion on their weekly TV show, which is something we wasn't getting with Brock Lesnar. How do you feel now with Brock Lesnar as the WWE Universal Champion for a third time, David? Well, I know, like when that happened, the, the you know the social media and the internet uh, ruled the collective eyes. But I mean, we kind of WWE and the fans have kind of made their own bed with this WWE in the respect that they haven't pushed anybody consistently and strong enough of all this 50-50 booking to have any real options in that main event, like or they're not very deep in main event. They need to, as I said, create these new characters. Uh, but also. People want to see Brock Lesnar, but then the moment when they get exactly what they asked for, you know, it's like the the know they're going to get the suplex monster who just like you know overwhelms everybody and then F fives them and then wanders off for a few months. But as you said, you know, in a certain respect, it it does create a bit of um, specialness about his appearances. You know, if somebody's on TV every week, then you have people complaining about that just as much. Whereas it goes back to the old type of booking where you'd have a champion win a title and then they might not wrestle for another month or two before there was the pay-per-view. You'd get the secondary matches and the squash matches and everything else and lower tier stars wrestling. But the champion was you know, kept for the pay-per-view or at least until a week or two before where there might be a tag team match that built up the new challenger who might get a pinfall over them. And you're like, oh, maybe they might be able to beat them. And so it, 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 this, it's hard because you've got this product that needs constant um, evolving and you've got at the same time you need to keep things special so if, if you've got constantly like people on TV then fans are going to tire of them very quickly especially with the amount of different shows and the sheer amount of wrestling on TV but you've also need to make your character special so less is more you know um, I, I don't know how, where we go from here but I, I don't have a problem with Brock because he, he does you know, attract interest, whether people just want to see him beat or you know, just want to see what's going to happen next. So uh, I don't have an issue with him at all. Yeah, it does make you wonder because I was kind of uh, fairly convinced that he was going to cash in on Kofi uh, to be the WWE champion because, of course, SmackDown is going to be airing on Fox from October and they want a more sports based, more kind of reality based products. I don't know how much of that they're going to get when it finally airs on Fox. Um, but you would have thought that uh, Fox would have been clambering over a name such as uh, Brock Lesnar. You know, we, we kind of half expect Ronda Rousey to be on SmackDown come October as well. And kind of those, those that have the more uh, reality based uh, fighting background. So I was quite surprised to see that uh, he's kind of rekindled his rivalry with Seth Rollins here, um, considering we, we've we've had it once already this year. Um, but uh, no, like you say, it is what it is. Um, and it looks like we're going to be getting a rematch at SummerSlam between Seth and Brock after Seth won a, a 10-man battle royal at the end of uh, this week's Raw. I mean, just, just to look at some of the highlights from this week's Raw, if it's OK, David, we, we saw uh, Cedric Alexander get a surprise win over Drew McIntyre. And you said earlier, you know, we, we both said that Drew McIntyre is one of these wrestlers. They really need to be pushing to the moon as a, a serious badass heel. Uh, but he seems to be getting beaten more than it, more than the, the victories that he seems to gain. Uh, you had Samoa Joe defeat Finn Balor. Um, and, and then we saw uh, the return of Bray Wyatt, the fiend. Now, I think that was one of the highlights of Raw this week. Um, so I know that you, you, you catch Monday Night Raw every single week, David. What were your thoughts? on kind of uh, this segment especially the return of, of Fiend Bray Wyatt's got a, got a good reaction from the fans um, and uh, from what I understand so what were your thoughts when you saw him it's been building for weeks we've had uh, weeks if not months of the Firefly Funhouse which has been one of the highlights of Raw of course and now uh, Bray Wyatt is back in the flesh uh, what kind of how did it unfold in your eyes when you saw this um, from, from this past week 
Um, well, it's exactly how I felt about Bray Wyatt when he first came in, doing the whole Wyatt family shtick and everything else. It was different, and it was, um, you know, something that you, like, get excited about. I mean, Raw's become, a, you know, a show of moments now. It's like you can pick out two or three moments that you're really excited about that week, and that this was, you know, the main one, really. And you immediately think, let's please get it right this time. You know, you had a sure fire thing with Bray Wyatt, and then uh, the problem was, is just as I've been speaking about a few moments ago, you put him on TV every single week with these long, long-winded long promos. You need yeah. less more. I think Bully Ray mentioned it on uh, a wrestling news site just today, that uh, or at least in the last 24 hours, that you know you need to protect the character like that, just like you do with any wrestler, really. You need less is more. You need to have anticipation from fans, and people want to put their tickets down to see, uh, pay their money to see um, you know, these wrestlers compete. And Bray Wyatt, you know, he's so creative and he's got such a just different character about him. And it's, it man, the, the fact that he's managed to rebuild himself after the absolute shambles he's had in the last few years of, of booking wise. I mean, you take a sure thing that just can't miss, that you can't possibly mess up and somehow manage to ruin it. And, and now they've got a second chance to create another headline act and a fresh act again. He's, he's a reborn almost, if, if you will. And, yeah. and the need that, you know, the need. I don't know why, going back to the Drew McIntyre thing, I mean, I can understand with the Samoa Joe, he has some injury issues and things like that, and Braun, they're not entirely sure on. But, I mean, Drew McIntyre has been consistent. He's consistent in the ring. He's very rarely injured. He's got the look and size that um, Vince covets. He's got, um, you know, he's, he's decent enough promo to put across what he needs to convey. So we need these characters. We need this rebuilding stage. And here we go into a, a, a feud with Bala, which I've got no problem with. Apparently, he's going to be taking some time off soon. And... Uh, and he's engaged, and well done, Finn. But, um, you know, he's another character that, that, that could be part of that main event mix um, if he was retooled, and a lot of people are saying heel turn, which I totally agree with, and maybe an association with the club down the road. But, you know, Bray's back now, and we've got a chance to have a real player that's going to, like, you know, fire up excitement in Raw, so hopefully they'll get it right this time. Yeah, and th- th- this past Monday's show um, also seemed to be revolving backwards and forwards between the AJ Styles and Ricochet feud, with AJ Styles interfering in the Ricochet and the Usos versus Bobby Roode in the Revival earlier, earlier on in the night. And then Ricochet came out during the club's match um, against the Lucha House Party. So um, it looks like that feud is going to continue and possibly we'll see, well, I hope we see a rematch, uh, as I said earlier, between these two at SummerSlam, because I don't think we got quite got the match we were hoping for at Extreme Rules and hopefully they can kind of turn it up a notch at SummerSlam um, but another one of the highlights of Raw has to be the, the, the 24-7 championship and uh, I know the last time we spoke we were raving about the Firefly Fun House and the 24-7 championship and I think it's you know even, even a month or two months m- months on David it's still kind of the same the, the most entertaining spots uh, of, of the whole night it seems to be the more uh, comedy stuff or certainly the 24-7 uh, um, gimmick still lives on. Uh, we've raved a lot about our truth. Uh, Drake Maverick certainly seems to be pulling his weight, um, not in the bedroom department, unfortunately, because uh, um, he, he got he got pinned by our truth um, in his hotel room on his bed just as he was about to consummate his marriage. Um, his poor wife must be getting fed up with the whole situation, but uh, very entertaining nonetheless, David. Oh, definitely, and apparently Vince is a big proponent, a big uh, fan of Drake's work because he yeah, comp- yeah, yeah, and he, he doesn't he doesn't complain and he does what he's asked to do. I mean, throughout his career, um, Drake or Spud or you know whatever incarnation has always been viewed as very much a comedy character. He was an underdog character early in his career, like a Spike Dudley or a Rey Mysterio, and then he evolved into the rock star Spud, which was a bit more so a comedic in there. And then obviously his runs in TNA, which I mean, I feel right now that I didn't obviously see TNA, so maybe I'm a little bit biased again here. But I feel that like Drake has been utilised to the best of his ability. You know, he's 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 a small guy who can play that underdog role, which he showed a little bit this week on 205 Live for anybody who had the chance to see that. But um, you know, he's pretty good on the mic. He's uh, comedic and he's he's entertaining. And you know, our troops being again literally born again. You know, is is one of the most entertaining highlights of Raw, and apparently. They're given a lot of creative freedom with these uh, 24-7 and they're, they're able to just do pretty much what they want to do and come up with their own stuff, which really shows, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not that stilted kind of dialogue that you get in a lot of the backstage promos and stuff like that. And 
uh, you know, Troops being Comedy Gold and Drake's being right there with him. Yeah, absolutely. And just just looking at uh, SmackDown very briefly, you've obviously got the the ongoing feud between Kevin Owens and uh, Shane McMahon, of course. Um, Alistair Black and Cesaro had their rematch from Extreme Rules in another really good match. Not not quite to the same standard as their Extreme Rules match, but still very very good nonetheless. Uh, the Iconics. Uh, they, they retained their WWE Women's Tag Team Championships against the Kabuki Warriors. Um, uh, I, I think it was was it a count out victory for the Kabuki Warriors, but so the Iconics uh, retained their championships. Um, there's possibly a, a rematch um, ahead for for those two teams at SummerSlam, or at least you know it'd be good to see the bounce off of the Iconics sooner rather than later. In my opinion, it's really dropped off of a cliff since they won it at WrestleMania. In fact, half the time I can barely remember who the champions are, um, and they. You had a, a surprise win for Apollo or Apollo Cruz over Andrade. Now, we all thought that Andrade was a character that they were trying to get behind and, and push um, and uh, you know, a future champion. Um, and I know we're going to be talking a bit about Apollo in the NXT roundup, but uh, here he is on SmackDown getting a surprise victory over Andrade. So give us your kind of um, thoughts on, on SmackDown, the kind of Ken Owens and Shane McMahon feud. And what are two of the bits of obstacles that caught your eye this, this past Tuesday? Well, as I said, I mean, when it comes to Shane, uh, I'm pretty much sick of the sight of him on TV, uh, and obviously he botched that stunner as well. Didn't he? But um, um, Kevin Owens are always going to prefer on the heel side of the fence, but if that's what they've got for him right now and it keeps him on TV, he, you know, he's one of the most consistent performers there. Uh, a couple of things that I had issue with on SmackDown was the length of a lot of the matches. There was a lot of very short matches on this week, I noticed, and, you know, yeah, adding countouts and stuff to that, it wasn't really, you know, a wrestle heavy show or one that was particularly memorable in that department. Another thing that's been a big problem that fans go on about right after a pay per view is to then throw out the, the same match again for free, which doesn't exactly encourage people to like, you know, buy buy the event if that especially if that's what they've tuned in for. I mean they gave with Cesaro and Black again and then they gave with Dolph and uh, Kevin Owens for a, a minute or two as well. But uh, uh, um, SmackDown again. Um, that would be the wrestle centric show, and he said, you know, that we're going to Fox, and they want all of these, <clears throat> you know, and 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 it's funny because looking at the booking side of it, if you if you're going to have a more reality based product that Fox is obviously crying out for, once once when they go there, you would have thought that Paul Heyman would have been the one to be booking SmackDown, or even maybe Triple H from a uh, by what he's done with NXT, but apparently we're going to have Eric Bischoff and. He's busy familiarising himself with the product, so hopefully he'll get an idea of you know what these characters are about and be able able to evolve them. Because it, it's sad when you see a character like Bailey, who was like you know super over at one time, is getting groans and even boos now. You know because people have become so bored with these characters, they need more tears to their characters and they need evolving as the word of the day that we've been talking about. You know, but. Uh, yeah. SmackDown has always been the show that everybody says, well, Raw wasn't very good this week, but I can guarantee I'll get some good wrestling on there. And see characters like Andrade, again, this 50-50 booking where one minute he's the hot new thing and next minute he's getting beat by somebody who's barely been on TV. You wonder where they're going with this, but hopefully, you know, they're going to rebuild him because he's another one that should be, you know, if not in the top tier, just teetering about there because he's certainly a superlative talent and, you know, deserves that shot. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's probably too early to tell when it's, it's early days with Heyman in his new role and Eric Bischoff will eventually settle into his new role. Um, I'm optimistic as a, as a lifelong WWE fan, I'm sure with yourself, that uh, it will improve. And I think that, that they do see that there's an opportunity here to kind of move the product forward. And I think we have seen, um, you know, glimpses of what Paul Heyman, uh, what his, his intentions are. And uh, we know that SmackDown down has its potential as well um it's certainly got the the characters it's certainly got the the the, the roster and the names and uh, the capability with um some of the best wrestlers in the world but um yeah i i think the product has moved along a little bit since we last spoke because we we've spoken on a few episodes now about the the state of raw and the state of smackdown but i think overall and it certainly if you do you know if you if you look at news sites 
and uh, various other podcasts. I think that the general commentary about those two shows has been a little bit more positive than, say, two or three months ago. Um, but um, yeah, so we shall we shall keep our fingers crossed and talk more about uh, Raw and SmackDown uh, the next time we catch up, David. But uh, let's have a, let's have a look at our, our two favourite uh, wrestling subjects, NXT and NXT UK, shall we? And uh, we'll have a, have a look at NXT UK first. And we had a, an introduction from uh, Sid Scala saying that we've got an incredible episode in store for us this week with uh, Zaya Brookside taking on Ginny, Saxon Huxley and Tyson T-Bone taking on uh, Fabian Eichner and Marcel Bartel and Mark Andrews taking on Cassius Sono, plus an address from uh, NXT UK Women's Champion Tony Storm. So the first match of the night was Marcel Bartel, Fabian Eichner, uh, two of the four members of Imperium, of course, going up against Tyson T-Bone and Saxon Huxley. So in this match, uh, Eichner shows everyone how powerful he is, catching Tyson T-Bone in midair before planting T-Bone with an almighty power slam to the canvas. Uh, Bartel delivers a headbutt to Saxon Huxley in the corner before delivering a double drop kick, sending Huxley crash into the floor on the outside. Huxley gets a close near fall, uh, making the tag only for Tyson T-Bone to be pulled from the ring um, before having his head driven into the steel ring post and running knee from uh, Eichner. Uh, the steel ring steps, my apologies. And the match ends after five minutes, David, with Eichner and Bartels flying up a cut powerbomb combo for the victory. So uh, I thought this was a, you know, an entertaining opener and uh, the right team won, of course. We've always been uh, big fans of Eichner and uh, Bartel. And uh, yep, yeah, so uh, what were your thoughts on this opener to this week's NXT UK? I didn't have any problem with it, as you know. I'm a big fan of um, Imperium and especially Bartel. You know, I look at that guy and I always see money, as I say every time I'm on this podcast. You know, he's a um, a hybrid of uh, you know the European style and, and a bit of William Regal thrown in there. And, you know, fantastically athletic. He's a big guy and he can and he can move and he's certainly got the the mannerisms and everything down. What I did find a little strange was that they chose Saxton Huxley and T-Bone, who had been kind of a, you know, kind of kick-ass team before that, is the, the sacrificial lambs, as it were, to show how dominant uh, Imperium were, you know. The, the, they did pretty much get battered for the, for the majority of that match, you know. It was, it was entertaining, but I thought they could have maybe picked a, a local team just to get that heat with the crowd, even though it was downloaded, so it's hard to, like, really, you know, gauge the crowd and see who they would uh, get upset about them losing and whatever, but... It is what it is, and it's part of the establishing the dominance of this new faction. And with that, you know, it's storyline building. So that I'm all for that, you know. And, and it's progressing uh, Eichner and uh, Bartel, and you know, and again, I'm all for that because you know I was saying back in the day when they were losing matches a, a few months ago, and that that these are the future, and and this is what we need to invest in, and it's nice to see that. Mm. And then, then um, moving on to, uh, we, we had a, a, a promo from Travis Banks saying how this is just the beginning for the Kiwi Buzzsaw in NXT UK. So, um, I, I, I don't know, where do you stand on Travis Banks on NXT UK? I, 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 I don't know, I like him as a wrestler. I think he's quite bland as a personality. Um, I prefer him as a heel on the independence, if I'm perfectly honest with you, where he, where he does show a lot more character. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't know, he's had a couple of opportunities now on NXT UK at a match against Walter a couple of weeks back um what, what's your thoughts and what do you think that the future might hold for travis banks so, you know could he possibly get another opportunity at the title or who do you see him potentially feuding with next mm, it's it's a bit of a, a tough one because the, the path's not really clear for him i mean as you said he's had his opportunity and they seem to uh, unusually for an nxt brand kind of uh, rush through that and i thought he might have even been the one to challenge walter uh, probably unsuccessfully at um takeover but i don't know if they thought that yeah. was a, a money match. The the only thing I could see for his character now is maybe like getting a series of losses against like um, Devlin and a few others, and then becoming a very frustrated and becoming more heelish. But we we do have a lot of heels at the moment, and obviously you've got the likes of Noam Dog going through that kind of transformation and Imperium on top, and you know a few of us chasing in the heel department. So it's a tough one. He, he's mechanically solid. I think he needs. Something extra on the, as you said, you've seen it on the Indies. He can, he, he has got that um, character when he wants to, whether it's a heel or a face or whatever. But it just doesn't come across. He's just kind of there, and and he's not, you know, he's not terrible, and he's anything like that. He's just kind of a placeholder, and he hasn't really got that sort of extra something that makes a must see at the, at least in the NXT, more so on the Indies. But um, it, it's going to be a rebuilding stage, and and he needs another layer of his character for people to connect to. I think. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I think I'd be more invested in Travis Banks if he were to, like I say, get frustrated, turn heel. Um, I think it'd be a bit, a bit more entertaining, a bit more um, uh, watchable. But um, then we move on to our second match of the night on NXT UK. Zaya Brookside versus Ginny. Now, uh, there's, there's been a story building between uh, Ginny, Zaya Brookside and Jazzy Gabbert, of course, um, over the last few months. I think we actually spoke about the kind of the, the seeds of this feud the last time you were on the podcast. Um, um, and now Ginny says that she doesn't need Jazzy to beat Zaya Brookside, although she's got Jazzy Gabbert at ringside with her anyway. Uh, the match is only two minutes old before Jazzy gets involved on the outside, attacking Zaya, um, giving Ginny the, the upper hand after attacking Zaya on the outside. The match eventually um, goes to Ginny after Jazzy grabs at Zaya. Um, she grabs her trailing foot as she bounces off the ropes, causing Zaya to turn round, distracted, uh, faces Jazzy, allowing Ginny to roll Zaya Brookside up from behind for the surprise pinfall victory. Um, so uh, what were your thoughts on this one? It didn't go too long. This has obviously been a bit of a culmination of a storyline that's been building for a number of weeks now, David. I think that the kind of the, the Zaya Brookside feud with Ginny and Jazzy has worked, and it's certainly brought a little bit more uh, focus on Zaya Brookside, who's a very, very talented young wrestler. Um, but so what were your thoughts on this one? Could could it have gone a bit longer and could they have possibly saved it to a takeover? Uh, we, are we likely to get a rematch, do you think? Um, I, I thought it was uh, just a little disjointed. I, I don't want to keep like being on the negative here because, I mean, I, I should really hate Ginny because, um, you know, she's always up against my favourite Tony Stone, but she's a fantastic character and especially fantastic heel and you, on NXT, you haven't even seen a fraction of what she's capable of in the ring. But, you know, she's a brilliant uh, character, whether it's uh, talking or just, you know, being an absolute snot in the ring. Um, you know, she, she's got a lot of aggression, which was displayed in the match where, when she was on top. Um, it was a little weird because it seemed like they were giving Zaya a little bit of a push and then it kind of fell off. So, again, it's a little parody booking like you kind of see on the, the main roster. Obviously, it's helped both of the characters. It's helped, you know, Ginny show that, you know, she... She says one thing, does another. She's, you know, this entitled character who thinks she's better than everybody else and better dressed than everybody else. Uh, Zia seems to occupy this uh, underdog role, but, you know, she can get it done and she's got the odd upset here and there. But this kind of just brought the same, like, level for both of them. It didn't, like, establish one above the other because while Ginny won, it, it seemed, like, very cheap, which it, obviously she's got to do as a heel and whatnot. But there was a couple of spots there where it looked like it reminded me of the Mandy Rose incident, like where it seemed like Jazzy was a little late on that trip. Um, yeah. Also, the pinfall, I wasn't even sure it was a pinfall because, like, I mean, Zaya did the right, like, shocked face that I got beat, but the referee seemed to be a little unsure when he was, like, looking towards the corner as if that wasn't meant to be the finish, but maybe it was. And if it was done in that sort of surprise way, then it was very well done because it looked, you know, spontaneous and looked like. It wasn't really meant to happen, so it's took her by surprise. Hopefully, this leads to like Ginny getting pushed up the card in the women's division. Um, uh, that'll all depend on you know who comes out the champion after um, Cardiff, which I'm sure we'll discuss. Um, but you know, Ginny should always be in that mix because she's very talented and she's also engaging. It's like you know you you you're interested in a character because even though she's a bad guy, she's she's interesting. You know, she's a good promo, she's a good wrestler, and we haven't even seen the start from her yet. Yeah, totally agree. Then we see Imperium backstage who say that they have done what they said they were going to do and the only one that is left is Trent Seven. Walter says that he's going to do the same to Trent Seven as what he did to Tyler Bate. Alexander Wolf then steps in and says that Walter accepts Trent Seven's challenge and that it's announced later on in the, the episode of NXT UK that we're going to be seeing Trent Seven go up against Walter with the WWE UK Championship on the line next week, David. So what do you think of this segment? I know that you're a huge fan of Imperium and all the characters involved and we're going to be seeing Walter against Trent Seven next week I am but again I'm going to be the like naysayer here but there was a couple of things it was the if you noticed in that segment that Bartel spoke first and then and then Anthony Wolf and uh, Alexander Wolf sorry and then uh, Walter was kind of left to the end and, and it was like he was accepting the challenge for him and Walter seemed to like be a little bit taken by surprise by that but and then he just like rolled with it and said, "Yeah, I'll take him on and I'll I'll end him and you know just batter him basically." But that might lead you know down the line to like a little bit of internal strife, like you know I'm the leader, I should be making these decisions kind of thing. What I would have what I would have liked to seen is actually try and get the shot at Cardiff, and I would have liked to seen him run through the other members, whether it was 
They didn't have to necessarily get pinned, but I would like to have seen him like, you know, get one over on um Alexander and then maybe beat um Eichner and then, you know, it gets a DQ because they all come in and batter him um when he's wrestling Bartel. So it's basically running the gauntlet each week until we get the takeover. So then that bit, he's, he's working his way through Imperium. Can he get can he top a top of Walter and he's got this, you know, more aggression and showing a more aggressive side against Imperium and the willing to stoop to their level because it was discussed in the match like at the start of the show that despite the fact that they say the mat is sacred that you know they're willing to go to any lengths and bend the rules so you know it would nice, be nice to see a more you know cutthroat side of, of Trent that he's willing to get down and dirty with them which he's more than capable of doing you know so I would like to see that build up to Walter rather than just throw it out there I mean I felt like the match where you had Gallus against um, Mastiff and the Hunt could have happened at a takeover and rather than just given away on TV, you know, because I thought that could have been some type of elimination match with maybe like a no DQ stipulation to just amp, amp up the excitement and things like that. But it seems like a few of the matches that could have been a good takeover match have been given away early, and uh, I don't know what you think of that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And that there has been quite a few uh, good TV matches that could have been saved for uh, a, a bigger stage. Um, I'm kind of thinking, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't read the spoilers, but uh, I'm curious to see how the Trent Seven Walter match goes next week. Um, because I'm thinking of credible opponents for Walter's championship uh, and a credible opponent at TakeOver. And I can't think of too many unless they do a rematch with say Jordan Devlin or maybe Pete Dunn for example um, and Trent Seven would be the kind of the only one in that in that very short list that I think could pull off uh, an excellent match against Walter on a, on a stage such as a, a takeover I mean Trent Seven's been on many NXT takeovers before and he's definitely a very experienced member of the NXT UK roster um, so I don't know whether next week is, is going to be a bit of a uh, a, a bit of a, a messy finish or a, a, a no contest which could potentially lead to a rematch at a takeover I mean I I haven't heard or read any spoilers, but who do you think might be Walter's opponent uh, in Cardiff, David? Have you given it much thought? Well, as you said, it, un- unless you like it, you'd, you'd built the Devlin or whatever, it would seem like a bit of a um, placeholder, wouldn't it? Because they haven't they've been away or, or they've been you know doing other things, and it would seem like a, a bit sort of shoehorned in there. Whereas if, if they'd had Trent show this aggressive side then people could invest in the there might be a chance that he could, he could get the better of this monster walter you know and it, if he if he's plowing through the others and and as i said they might go with the you know having a match as i said with them and then imperium ruin it very quickly and that and then they're like okay you need your lackeys to hide behind and you know maybe they get banned from ringside for the a rematch that you know sid or, or um, um johnny saint announces that type of stipulation but I think they're throwing too much out onto it. They're giving too much away, and they're leaving themselves thin on options when it comes to the event. And it's it's fastly approaching. And we, I think this time when we came to the last takeover event, we had a lot better, you know, idea and understanding of who was doing what, you know. And right now, we've only really got the women's match, and you know, maybe Trent versus Walter. Well, um, we haven't got a lot of idea what to expect. No, absolutely. And um, I'm sure over the coming weeks we'll, we'll find out uh, a lot more because we are not that far away from TakeOver Cardiff. Uh, then we get uh, Gallus backstage with Joe Coffey calling out Dave Mastiff. Um, he wants a match with uh, Dave Mastiff, top boy versus top boy one on one. So that'll be a great match. And uh, I don't know if that was recorded at download, but I uh, get the feeling that we're going to be seeing that very soon. And then we get your favourite, Tony Storm. She comes out to the ring for an in-ring promo where she tells us that for the longest time she thought Kaylee Ray was one of her closest friends. Uh, Tony said that uh, Kaylee Ray used to be the first person to help someone and now she's the first person to attack somebody. Tony says that uh, she's sick of the mind games. And just then we get to Kaylee Ray's music. Uh, Kaylee Ray challenging Tony Storm to a match right here and now. But then Kaylee Ray changes her mind, saying that uh, she would hold off until NXT TakeOver Cardiff. So that is, as we've alluded to, our first match that's been officially announced for TakeOver Cardiff. Um, Tony Storm defending her NXT Women's Championship against Kaylee Ray. Now, we, we've spoken about these two before, and uh, we thought at one stage we were going to get a TV match between these two. Uh, looks like uh, WWE NXT, they've seen sense. They've uh, held off until TakeOver Cardiff. And I thought, I think that Kaylee Ray is the only plausible contender to a Tony Storm um, and uh, that in itself is, is you know a, a main event match anywhere you go um, definitely a match I'm looking forward to in Cardiff what, 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 what's your thoughts on this kind of promo between these two 
and uh, no doubt you're looking forward to the match at the end of August um, in Cardiff, David. Definitely, and I'm just almost as big a fan of Kaylee Ray as I am of Tony. And to be honest with you, I mean, a lot of people have alluded to this, but like Tony's strength, like as a um, as a face, like isn't promos. She, the, those promos are a little bit stilted, and she's much more natural, actually. If anybody's had the chance to see her stardom work, when she's a little bit heelish, not necessarily a heel, but she's got that little bit of swagger, like you know, I'm the best kind of thing. But yeah. um, it, uh, I've made a few little notes here about the history of uh, Kaylee Ray and Tony Storm because they've met many on many occasions outside of uh, WWE, and it's often, funnily enough, always been based around the fact that they are friends, but they're going to go to any length um, to beat one another. They've wrestled each other in the uh, it's Target Wrestling where Kaylee Ray went over uh, with a gory bomb, a uh, uh, finishing move. Uh, Tony's first Progress Women's Title Defense after becoming the first champion, the successful title defense was against Kaylee Ray, but she had to use a second rope, strong zero pile drive at the beater. Um, they had a no contest more recently in ICW where I think it was Casey uh, interfered and, uh, and ruined that match and basically caused a no contest there. They faced each other in stardom where they went to a time limit draw and even in Germany where Tony managed to win, I think it was for, with her um, strong zero again, but it was uh, for the WXW championship. I think she was a champion at the time. So they've, they've traded a lot of wins and there's been a lot of indecisiveness. So there's a lot of history there for people who know the past on the indies. And I hope that they give them a good 20 minutes, half an hour to build a good story, you know, because they're certainly capable of doing that. Looking at the past, they went like 20 minute quarter an hour matches that were really good and had fans on the edge of the seat by the end so hopefully we'll get something special at takeover that lives up to the billing absolutely so um I would say that's the first match that's been officially announced for takeover cardiff uh both uh, david and i will be there and uh if that's kind of how the card is shaping up with uh, matches to the calibre of Tony Storm versus Kaylee Ray, then uh, it's going to be an outstanding show and I can't wait. Uh, let's talk about the main event of NXT UK for this week. We had Cassie Sono versus Mark Andrews. So this has been a match that's been building for the last couple of weeks on TV. Um, in the early stages, Cassie Sono takes Mark Andrews apart. Um, before get, get, Andrews gets in three successive enziguris uh, before executing a somersault over the top rope, connecting with an excellent Hurricane Rana on the outside. Uh, Andrews gets a, a close two count from another Hurricane Rana back inside the ring. Ono gets a close near fall of his own after dropping Andrews face first from his shoulders. Andrews then spikes Ono with an inverted Rana before getting a very close near fall from that move. Andrews reverses um, a suplex attempt from Ono into a stun dog millionaire. Andrews gets another two count from a tornado DDT. Andrews attempts a shooting star press only to be caught with a cravat from Ono, uh, which uh, Ono turns into a cravat suplex. Uh, then a big boot, however... Just when it looks like uh, Andrews was uh, uh, down and out on top of Ono's shoulders, Andrews manages to get surprise pin for victory. Okay, it, I think it was a victory roll, uh, very similar to uh, the way Bret Hart used to win many of his matches back in the day. Got the one, two, three, and Mark Andrews was your victor. Um, so well, I thought this was a, an excellent main event. I wasn't, didn't really have high hopes or high expectations uh, going into this. I know that individually they're both very, very skillful, very um, highly accomplished and capable wrestlers i wasn't really looking forward to this match though if you, if you get my meaning but by the end of it i was completely sold and thought it was an excellent way to end this week's nxt david yes i, I mean i'll be honest with you i had kind of forgotten it become like a bit of an afterthought as a match in it and it was a weird one to put on when you think that the crowd had probably been there for like four tapings by that stage because it i think you probably agree it, it was a slow burner you know it was a a, a building uh, methodically with a lot of exchanges of holds as uh, you know uh, Ono tries to prove his uh, technical superiority and he's the British best and or despite not being British you know but uh, uh, it, it's weird with this character because you, you're never sure where they're really going with it because one minute he's winning by fair means or foul and, and next minute he's losing so again a bit of parody booking unfortunately which I hate to say that word keep coming up especially in association with NXT but the, the crowd was a bit flat for this, uh, whether it was tiredness or whatever, or just like, you know, the style of match it was, it, it lent itself to a slow build. But they got the fans back into it towards the end. That cravat spot was really good, like, you know, just kind of out of nowhere spot, which is, is really like the diverse style of Ono can still take you by surprise and, you know, excite you 
I, I just wonder with his character if they're gonna again get invested in it and give him any type of real push. And, and when it comes to like uh, Mark Andrews again, a capable performer, but are they gonna add another layer to his character, or is he gonna just keep jumping from you know singles matches to tag team match? I think Flash might be hurt again at the moment, so obviously that sort of negates them uh, team and whatever. But uh, I don't know where his uh, obviously he's the plucky underdog and he's very popular with the fans through the you know the mix of wrestling and music and simply that he's a likable. Yeah. I've met him a few times myself and he's he's a, a really lovely lad. But um, uh, I just like to see these characters and I'm sure we will get it with the booking team behind NXT UK and you know the the minds there the, the a bit of another next little layer of these characters and I'm actually looking forward to that like to see where they actually go with with Mark Andrews and uh, Ono both capable performance, you know, in the ring or, and especially in Ono's case when it comes to promos and angles and everything else. Yeah, and uh, that capped off a, a really good hour of NXT UK. Just looking at this week's NXT then. Um, so the first match that kicked us off uh, this week was uh, Matt Riddle versus Arturo Roas. So I think uh, Roas is the former Adrian Joward. Um, you might be able to pronounce uh, Arturo's surname better than I, but uh, it's a bit of a bit of a mouthful. Um, this, this, this match started with plenty of ground holes and grappling from these two with a bit of a kind of a, um, a mixed martial arts background from both of them. Uh, Rao has got uh, quite a bit of offense in on Riddle, Riddle to start the match, uh, which usually means that they possibly have plans for uh, Ataro uh, Rowers uh, in the future. Um, I know that uh, usually when they give somebody uh, a lot of offense in what could be seen as a, a bit of a, an enhancement match, they, they usually got plans for them. Uh, Riddle floored Rowers with a, a flash knee strike before attacking Rowers with a, a series of stiff punches, uh, causing the referee to get involved, stop the match after five minutes and ended the match via stoppage. So that, that was a good match for what it was. Um, not your typical NXT WWE match. Uh, it was a little bit uh, stiffer than that. Um, but uh, I thought that the match itself um, showed a lot of promise. And uh, I quite like the presentation of uh, Ataro uh, Rowers. And uh, Matt Riddle came out the victor. What were your thoughts on this match, David? Yeah, it was a little unusual. Even Minoru sort of referred to the fact that it was more like a throwback to when he's um, commentating on his MMA matches. Um, and obviously we saw Ruas uh, on the Evolve show as well. Um, he kind yes. of um, facially resembles uh, Sylvester Lefort, if you remember him with his, uh, the, the beard style and that. And then he wrestles kind of like a, a little bit like a Ken Shamrock, a lot of submissions and takedowns and things like that, and that, yeah. that MMA, MMA hybrid style. I don't know where they're going with him. He could make a consistent like you know, mid-card heel or something like that. But you know he's got, got that sort of savage um, you know, MMA look and there. Uh, that he's, he is actually 37 years old now, so uh, but he doesn't really look it, you know, um, and, and, and it was a, just a little bit different, you know, and that's, again, we spoke about earlier, what you need on a show, and I, and I think it tried to re-establish, you know, uh, if we're in any doubt of, despite his easy-go nature, uh, Riddle's toughness, and even though it was a short match, it, it did neither of them any harm, you know, it, it re-established Matt Riddle as you know, a threat to any championship and any champion or any wrestler in NXT, and it introduced uh, Ruas more to the audience that might not be familiar with him as, you know, somebody to watch out for and he's dangerous, so I really enjoyed it for what it was. Yeah, definitely. And the action didn't stop there with Riddle getting attacked from behind during his post-match celebration by a masked big man who uh, did eventually unmask himself to be the returning Killian Dane. So Dane destroyed Riddle with several huge sentons in the in middle of the ring before throwing Riddle into the ring post, taking the attack to the outside. Uh, the attack progressed up the rampway before Dane struck with one more sent on, this time taking both of them, certainly driving Matt Riddle through the stage floor in, uh, with the fans chanting Yowie Wowie, uh, bringing an end to that segment. So uh, um, the return of Killian Dane, like I say, we, we were always big fans of him when he was part of Sanity, certainly in their NXT run. Uh, you wouldn't even know that they had a main roster run, but they did. Uh, but we've got uh, Sanity seems to have dispersed and uh, disbanded and they've got uh, their own kind of careers now Killian Dane back on NXT um, great to see him back and it looks like uh, it could be a, a really good opponent for Matt Riddle but um, a good segment here um, after the match with the attack from Killian Dane what do you think what are your thoughts on this one David definitely I mean aside from Eric Young right now all the members of Sanity are you know being re-established and I said as much on their Facebook somewhere that you know Apollo Crews um, Killian Dane and Tyler Breeze have been better established and you know 
um, almost recreated uh, back in NXT than they were in uh, arguably in the entire you know main roster run. I mean, Killian Dane for a, such a huge guy was invisible on the on the main roster pretty much, and it's such such a waste because I mean I've seen that guy when he was wrestling on the Indies as Demo have uh, fantastic matches with uh, smaller opponents. Usually, he's one of these men, the big men that like smaller wrestlers with that you know athletic style can work around, and to see him just sitting on the sidelines and frustrated and not working, you know, and this is going to be unusual as well because you've got that bruiser style of um, Killian Dane and then you've got that striking style of Riddle, so you're going to get a physical war between them that oh, yeah. some type of stipulation match or whatever, but I totally look forward and I totally look forward to a lot more Killian Dane. Yeah, it certainly is going to be stiff and physical when they do eventually meet in the in the ring. Uh, then we get an advert for next week's Raw. It's advertised as Raw reunion. You're going to get um, old NXT or sorry WWE superstars uh, such as Razor Ramon, Ted DiBiase, Sarge Slaughter, Hulk Hogan's going to be there, and the biggest name of them all, of course, in the shape of Stone Cold Steve Austin. So that should be quite a good um, set of uh, characters to see and to look forward to on next week's Raw. Hopefully it won't take away too much from the build towards SummerSlam and kind of the the, the, the newer, more relevant uh, talents. Um, but uh, it, it should add a, a nice old school element to next week's Raw. Any thoughts on that? And, and with some of the names that I've mentioned, anybody that you're looking forward to seeing in particular? Well, obviously they're going to take up a lot of the time on Raw, but I hope. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I was booking it, I'd probably go with the obvious, use one of the old timers as a way to establish a heel, basically have somebody, I don't know if a, a Hulk Hogan would allow it or somebody like that, but like, you know, have a Drew McIntyre rebuild himself on the fact that he's done a cowardly attack on, you know, some re- wrestler that's not, I mean, look at how well that worked for Randy Orton, you know, like, he, he's attacking people like Sergeant and Slaughter and stuff like that, that basically yeah. made his character and rebuilt a character that, again, at the time wasn't really connecting with fans, but Drew needs that badly, so uh, something like that, you know, or, or other than just the typical, you know, come out and wave and say hi to everybody and Austin hits a stunner that's getting worse and worse because the person that he's doing it on is getting older and older. But, you know, I'd like to see them used in a style and hopefully with Heyman behind the scenes and you know, being a good friend of Austin and stuff like that, we'll get something special and not just the usual, you know, reason to rule them out for ratings. Oh. Yeah, and, and then we get to the Street Profits backstage. You send out a message to Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish, who will likely be their takeover Toronto opponent. Uh, that will be a fantastic match between those two teams if that were to happen. Uh, we also see footage, uh, fan footage apparently, of Mia Yim attacking Marina Shafir in the parking lot, adding a few of the fuel to the fire in the feud between uh, Mia Yim and Shayna Baszler, which is also penciled to be the uh, NXT Women's Championship match at TakeOver Toronto. So, uh, and then we get our next NXT breakout tournament match. So I know that uh, David, uh, just like myself, you've been a big fan of this tournament and the previous three matches have been fantastic. Uh, this one was no different. And this one was between Dexter Loomis versus Bronson Reed. So Bronson Reed was a, a, a big guy, 330 pounds. One of the most impressive spots in the early stage, however, was uh, Loomis who barged Bronson Reed to the outside, followed up with an impressive somersault over the top rope. Reed moved out the way, but Loomis was still able to land on his feet, which I thought was pretty impressive considering that Dexter Loomis is not exactly a cruiserweight. He's a pretty, pretty big guy, um, but not missing a beat. Uh, Bronson Reed follows up with a crossbody, squashing Loomis on the outside. Loomis soon takes control with a like a neck crank, which is utilised for a few minutes in the centre of the ring. However, Reed regained control with a power slam and a giant back body drop, followed by a sent on for a two count uh, Loomis demonstrated his immense power with a, a back suplex on the 330 pound Bronson Reed however Loomis fails to connect with a swanton bomb from the top rope allowing Reed to deliver a devastating splash from the top turnbuckle for a one two three I love this match um, I can't say enough good things about it I think that the tournament as a whole has been fantastic the previous um, three first round matches have been fantastic it's really highlighted some of the newer talents that they've recently signed. But I think all of the matches have had uh, their own style to it. They don't appear to have been kind of paint by numbers WWE or NXT matches. They seem to have their own kind of little, um, I don't know, I, I just really enjoy it for the, the uniqueness of these matches and the uniqueness of the tournament. Uh, this match in particular, I really, really enjoyed Love uh, Dexter Loomis, um, but Bronston Reed, I think he's going to be a star of the future. Um, love that big splash at the end. What did you think? Totally agree. I'm sitting here nodding my head, but as, as you said, um, 
I mean, Bronson seemed to be the one they were highlighting more with uh, the promos and talking about um, Australian strong style uh, that he was going to show. Um, but Dexter Loomis, from the moment he came out, impressed me, and I think they got it. I don't think they've got it quite right yet with um, Damien, um, the new, I can't even remember his second name now. Um, but anyway, um, I don't Priest. Think that's the one. Um, yeah. See, there's so many name changes. But anyway, yeah. um, I don't think they've got his character quite right when it comes to his entrance and just the vibe of him. But Dexter was spot on. I mean, he's supposed to be this creepy, almost like the Dexter character on TV. Yeah. You know, psychopath, a killer kind of character. The whether it was the graphics on the screen, the the weird kind of Stranger Things style music, his mannerisms, and the way. I mean, he, there was even one spot during the match where he licked uh, Bronson Reed. You know, and, <laughs> and fans reacted to that. And you know the kip ups and, the, and right into the the leg drop. I mean, he really surprised me, as you said. He's he's about six one and about two thirty five, I think. And you know, I hadn't really seen a lot of him as Samuel Shaw on TNA, but I was really impressed that a man of that build could move like that. He's he's thirty five, I think now, and you know, he's he's still um, got a, a good few years in him. And with this character, it's so different to anything else that's on NXT. You know, he's a really dark, creepy character in the vein of a. Bray Wyatt or something like that, and there's so much mileage there with the character and the, you know, he could be creeping around backstage and kidnapping people and he could go that route and all the rest of it, you know, just really sleazy, horrible, unnerving character. Even the commentators were like, you know, he gives me the creeps and that's exactly what you want. And I yeah. love I loved the little comment that um, um, Minoru made at the end where he, he requested, um, Bronson Reed had requested some um, sauce to go with the pancake that he's just made out of Dexter Loomis, so that, and that that's <laughs> That's why I love it. it, it they just create little extra nuances for these characters when when they do that, you know, just the little the little bits in the match, and that's where NXT excels. And I, I, like yourself, I absolutely loved it, and I want to see way more of both. Yeah, definitely. And we uh, get the first of the semi-final matches next week. Uh, we then see Tyler Breeze in a backstage interview uh, before being interrupted by the Forgotten Sons with Breeze mistakenly calling Jackson Riker Buddy Murphy, which I thought was uh, very entertaining, very funny. Uh, we will more than likely be getting a match between Tyler Breeze and Jackson Riker in the near future. We've not seen a lot of Jackson Riker um, as, as an in-ring talent. I think we've only seen him in one or two matches on NXT TV. He's been mostly kind of the, the kind of outside manager person that would interfere in matches type of person um, but it looks like we're going to be getting a match between Tyler Breeze and Jackson Riker in the near future then we get a recap from last week uh, where we saw the new and improved Io Shirai um, who reminded us that she doesn't need any friends and she doesn't need any of the fans and we will see the heel Io Shirai in a one-on-one -on -one match next week against Katie Catanzaro and that should be a really fun match looking forward to that definitely looking forward to seeing the heel Io Shirai and uh, we, we always get to quite an entertaining match when we see Casey with all of her uh, very athletic uh, maneuvers but uh, I know you're a big fan of uh, heel uh, Io Shirai. Um, tell us a little bit about it and kind of what you like so much about uh, the new gimmick. I'm hoping that, I mean, obviously I can see it being like Casey trying to like, uh, you know, wrestle around and fight around and just out quick Io. And then I can see Io cutting her off and use it. And I hope she uses a more deliberate style where she's like concentrating on the strikes and submissions and things like that. And maybe not trying to entertain the fans so much with a uh, genius of the sky spots, you know, um, I could imagine being a much darker character. I don't know in the long term like where her character fits into the whole scheme of uh, title matches and what that. I, I suppose that will depend who's champion. Uh, but I don't know even though if she might ruin things for like a Mia Yim or something like that. But I definitely see her absolutely destroying uh, Casey at some point, which is a shame because you know Casey again maybe not the most ideal one for sacrificial lamb because she's coming up, but. She's inexperienced, so obviously somebody like Io, who's very experienced, will uh, capitalise on that, and we'll see a, a new savage, darker side of uh, Io, and she can develop that character that she's going with, you know, that she doesn't need anybody and doesn't need the fans, it's much more cutthroat. So, you know, uh, hopefully it'll be a, a good, um, you know, display for Casey to establish an uh, underdog, kind of high-flying style that's very entertaining for the fans, but also more so to establish Io as this new killer heel. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think as much as I'm looking forward to the match next week between KC and EO, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we see an appearance from uh, Candice uh, LeRae and uh, some interference there, possibly. But uh, we'll have to look forward to see that next week. Uh, then we get what I thought was the match of the night for myself, Kashida versus Apollo Crews. So uh, Apollo made his big return to a great reception to the fans at uh, Full Sail. Um, and I'm sure that uh, that did a lot for his confidence. He's obviously had, a, like so many others quite a, a really downtrodden run on the main roster um He's been used very poorly on the main roster. And I, I, was, I was surprised that he was called up to the main roster so quickly when he first joined NXT. I think that obviously Vince McMahon or somebody saw you know, how great he looked and how great he moved, but they didn't know what to do with him when he came up onto the main roster. But he was a perfect fit for NXT and really needed to be there a bit longer to establish himself. But now he's back. Um, and uh, and as Mauro Ronaldo said on commentary, this is a, a, a dream match for many fans. Kushida versus Apollo Crews. Um, so what are your thoughts on Apollo being back on NXT? He got a tremendous reception from the from the Full Sail fans. Um, and uh, yeah, it sounded like he was, he, he felt like he was back home. Yeah, definitely. I mean, going back historically with um, Apollo Crews when he was on the Indies and then particularly in Dragon Gate as Uha Nation, I always looked at him and thought this is a future superstar in WWE. I always thought that he, he was going to end up there and sure enough he did. I didn't realize, obviously, working with those smaller wrestlers, how um, you know small he is build-wise and stuff like that. But he was still super athletic for somebody who's so densely uh, muscled, and you know, and, it, and he's got that kind of uh, friendly charisma that it's easy, to, you know, just like a Kofi Kingston or somebody like that. But it, it was strange because even though he was pretty much using the same routine that you would see on a Raw or something like that, but with this more time and obviously the more positive atmosphere, it, it created a much more as I said, it made him much more comfortable in the ring, which seemed to make the match flow much more smoothly and the way able to work with each other. I don't know if they've ever worked with each other before, with being the difference between New Japan and Dragon Gate and whatnot, but it, it just seemed he was revitalised, much like a Tyler Breeze and even a Killian Dane. But um, hopefully it'll, it'll lead to him being able to re-establish himself as an athletic yeah, babyface that can you know, fit into the NXT and be a, a positive part of that roster. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought that this was Kushida's best match since he'd come up to uh, NXT. And I thought the two of them gelled really, really well. I mean, just in some of the key spots of the match, uh, Kushida nailed Cruz with a handspring um, back elbow before connecting with a Tornado DDT. Got a two count from that exchange. Uh, Cruz gets a, a two count of his own from a big boot before dropping Kushida with some devastating German suplexes, finally getting a two count from a, a standing shooting star press. Uh, Kushida regained control with a reverse STO, getting a two count from a, a springboard hurricane runner then in one of the scariest spots of uh, i've seen in a long time both men were perched upon the top turnbuckle they looked like they were going to do a perform like a spanish fly to start off with however both men kind of launched themselves flipped over and kind of in mid-rotation kashida appeared to um execute an arm bar in mid-air or well, certainly that's how it kind of transpired when they both landed uh kashida uh, finished this uh, really good match off with a, a tap out victory thanks to a, like a Kimura lock and um, yeah well welcome back uh, Apollo Crews but um, this was kind of a, a, a bit of a, a homecoming of sorts for Kashid. I thought this was his best match he's had and the two of them uh, they pulled off a tremendous match what did you think David? Definitely and you wonder you know he was just there, Kushida. He was he was doing okay, and he was wrestling these different uh, people from Two or Five Live and the NXT UK brand. In the case of Cassius Ohno, was kind of transplanted into that, and he he was he, he just needed that breakout match, and this might have been it. And now you can see him like hopefully like going because you know it's been very quiet on the um, Velveteen Dream front, and you could almost see a match like building between them two. Now he's definitely a a contender for whatever title he chooses to go after, but yeah. I think that match really helped establish him more with the fans as like somebody that's exciting to get behind and whatnot, even though they've moved away, it seems, a little bit from his kind of Back to the Future character, changing the, the hoverboard lock to the, is it the Saka, Sakaruma lock or whatever, I'm probably mispronouncing that, I'll get used to it too. Um, but, you know, you can see him going forward as a contender for whatever championship with the right build, and Again, a revitalized Apollo Crews who fits in nicely wherever he's needed in that uh, babyface role, whether it's like, you know, going up against a, an undisputed era or whatever. He, he may not win, but he, he seems to be happy where he is, and, and that's half the battle. And he, he's 
he seems exciting to watch again. He's not he's not just a placeholder or a card filler or you know the the popcorn match or whatever. But uh, hopefully, uh, on the good things for Apollo. Mm, I hope so. I really do hope so. Uh, and then another wrestler we hope there's kind of good things for in the future. Keith Lee. He's interviewed backstage by Kathy Kelly, and he's reminded that he's been with the company a full year now. Uh, Lee says that um, uh, that maybe he's been overlooked up until then, and that uh, he should be the one to change the narrative and to be the one to beat the newcomer for a change. And he's got his eyes set on Damian Priest, and uh, that match will take place on next week's NXT, and of course we'll be covering it right here on the podcast. But uh, Damien Priest versus Keith Lee. Um, good match to look forward to there, David. I, I, I hope that Keith Lee gets the, the, the push that he deserves. But uh, once again, you kind of think the, the, the newcomer, Damien Priest, might get the win here. Uh, where's, your, where's your kind of head at regarding these two? Definitely, I could see that it being a match to establish uh, Damien Priest as the new monster, unfortunately at the expense of Keith Lee. I could imagine it being a lot like a, a Dijakovic match that he had, uh, where it was a really good match, but unfortunately had a no decision. So uh, the best case scenario would actually be something like that, because then maybe it could lead to a rematch at a takeover, which where they could like tear the house down and really show what they can do in a in a big guy style of match, you know. But that would probably be better with a Dijakovic. Unfortunately, he's injured, but we could really get to see you know a real physical fight if we if we get it on like a. NXT Toronto or something like that. So the best case scenario I could hope for with these two is they get some kind of non-finish, which doesn't hurt either of them. It you know just shows that they went to the point where neither of them could get that advantage over the other and the very sort of on the same level. Because Keith Lee needs a little bit rebuilding. He he's been exceptional at times and other times he's just sort of been there again. You know, so he needs to kind of establish himself where the fans can go. Yeah, he's. He's a real player, and you know he can be a main, in the main event mix too. And and Damian Priest needs that too. So it's going to be interesting to see which way they go with it. Hopefully, it'll be a match that will help uh, elevate both men. Yeah. And then we're on to our kind of a, 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 a main event segment, uh, Adam Cole. So Adam Cole comes out to address uh, the Full Sail crowd, telling us how he's been traveling the world in his championship celebration tour. Um, he says that, uh, that there is a, an undisputed power switch in NXT, and he reminded us that he's going to be a fighting champion. He's ready to take on all comers anywhere, anytime, and anybody. He's ready to put his NXT championship on the line. Cole t- tells the fans that he's ready to put his championship on the line tonight, uh, and he does against the, the kind of the big dude that we've been seeing in various uh, clips with uh, Johnny Gargano going back to uh, Pittsburgh, I believe, and then Adam Cole on his celebration tour. And it's a, a young man called Twain Tucker. Cole tells uh, Twain that he's uh, given him an opportunity of a lifetime and that uh, he'll give him a chance to at least slap the taste out of his mouth and that uh, there's, there's none of his undisputed era stablemates around to get involved. Uh, Twain tells Cole that he didn't come al- alone, however. Uh, just then we hear Johnny Gargano's music and out comes Gargano um, and he comes out and, and attacks Adam Cole, the NXT champion, they fight into the crowd. Uh, Cole gets thrown into the guard railings. And just when you think the referees have it under control, Gargano being led to the backstage area, we see Gargano come flying off the stage, landing heavily onto Adam Cole before pummeling Cole with lefts and rights. So Gargano manages to fight Cole uh, back into the ring where Gargano connects with a super kick and then he applies the Gargano escape, eventually releasing the hold, signaling that he wants match number three, David. So it looks like we've got our main event set for TakeOver Toronto. The the match at NXT TakeOver New York was a classic two out of three falls match. Then they had uh, a rematch um, where uh, Johnny lost the championship to Cole at TakeOver 25. And now we're possibly heading for a third match between these two in Toronto. Um, is this a match that kind of excites you much? We know we're going to get an excellent match, a good you know, four, four and a half, possibly five star match. But um, is it one match too many or is this a, a match that you're looking forward to? I'm definitely looking forward to it. And I have to um, talk about the whole Adam Cole tour and the little bait and switch that they did there where he says he was going to fight somebody that was on that video naturally making the majority of fans believe that he was going to fight Gargano and then to have the trainee come out instead it was just typical undisputed era um you know shady tactics and you know it should be exactly what Cole's trying to achieve you know he's going to take any route possible but again you know a match that you might not have cooled off a little bit and not necessarily had that much excitement for um going into it for a third time 
was because of the way NXT books things, or the excitement and the build and the you know left on the cliffhanger of you know the the champs in trouble and can he survive another? Uh, I think it's going to be a two out of three falls again. And for me, it's like you get a lot of fans that say, "Oh God, they're wrestling again and they're wrestling again." And you, you, you know, back in the day, wrestlers would wrestle each other dozens of times, whether it was on house shows or TV or whatever. And fans didn't bat an eyelid simply because they were seeing superstars. But now you, you get wrestlers wrestling each other two or three times, and fans are complaining about it. You got two absolutely world class wrestlers, and Johnny yeah. Gargano and Adam Cole. Why you should ever complain about seeing them for a third time is it just. It blows my mind that anybody could have anything to say about that. Yeah, we want new feuds, and yeah, we want, and I'm sure we will have after this match. But you know, to see them a third time and see where they can take it. I mean, you look at the look at the Champa and uh, Gargano feud, feud. You know, it's like they managed to have a series of matches where they were against each other again and again on takeovers, and they always managed to take it in another direction and add another layer because of the fantastic booking crew and uh, just the wrestlers themselves and the whole team that they have there, they're always able to give you another layer and another swerve, which is often what's missing on the main roster and what makes NXT so great. So, yeah, to answer your question in a long-winded manner, I'm, I'm, I'm buzzing for it. I, I can't wait for it. Yeah, me, me, me as well. I can't wait. And uh, um, I think we've only got about three weeks to wait until TakeOver Toronto. Uh, certainly that that's uh, around about the time of TakeOver and SummerSlam weekend. So uh, it's going to be a quick turnaround. We're going to be get, getting the matches announced um, over the next few weeks. But uh, as we've said a million times, David, NXT TakeOvers, they never disappoint. Um, so I'm sure it'll be a fantastic card. I, for one, will be staying up. Uh, can't wait to see that one. So that kind of capped off a, an excellent episode of NXT. I, I really enjoyed uh, the match between Matt Riddle and uh, Rowers to start off with, and then the attack from Killian Dane. I thought the NXT breakout tournament match between Bronson Reed and Dexter Loomis was fantastic. Um, I thought the match of the night for me was Kushida Apollo Crews. Absolutely loved that match um, and uh, really kind of highlighted both wrestlers uh, skills and style in the ring and then uh, Johnny Gargano attacking Adam Cole and then setting up their championship match for Toronto uh, to cap off this week's NXT so uh, David that that uh, caps off another episode of uh, Wrestling with Johnners as well so I want to thank you so much for helping us out with this podcast this week um, I hope you've enjoyed it thoroughly enjoyed it and can't wait to come back again and do it all again Thank you very much, David. Uh, so I uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode. And once again, if, if you did, please don't forget to hit like, subscribe, share and shout about this podcast. Tell your friends and tell your family and keep listening to the Wrestling with Jonas podcast for all of your weekly NXT UK, NXT and WWE updates. Um, once again, you can find us on Twitter um, at with Jonas underscore pod on Instagram at Wrestling with Jonas and on Facebook. Just search Wrestling with Jonas. So we'll be back again in a week's time with our weekly um, recap of NXT and NXT UK, as well as covering all the big news stories from around the wrestling world as we get ever closer to TakeOver Toronto and SummerSlam. So once again, from myself and from David, thank you very much for listening. Take care and speak to you all soon. Mm-hmm.